Dialectic of Defeat, Contours of Western Marxism by Russell Jacoby. Chapter 1, Conformist Marxism. So much the worse for the facts. With these words of Fichte, Lucas closed the first draft of what is orthodox Marxism. To the skeptical, perhaps to the sympathetic, the words are outrageous. Marxism is not contradicted by the facts. The facts are duplicit or at best mute. To quantify, classify, or categorize facts is to capitulate to them. Truly orthodox dialectical Marxists paid little attention to the so-called facts. The averse is plainer and more convincing. The facts can confirm Marxism. The large events, as well as the small, prove the truth of the theory. The Russian and Chinese revolutions, imperialism, and the crises of capitalism all demonstrate the continuous validity of Marxism. Marxism is compelling precisely because it is accurate and finally because it is successful. It works. The strength of the working class as well as the victory of several revolutions leaves little doubt. Success is the proof. Success, this is the rub. How does one evaluate success? The 17th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party of 1934 announced that the party had triumphed everywhere. Stalin declared that socialism was now the sole commanding force. The official account dubbed this meeting the Congress of Victors. Several decades later, in 1956, Khrushchev indicated how the victors fared. Of the 139 members and candidates of the party's central committee who were elected at the 17th Congress, 98 persons, i.e. 70%, were arrested and shot. The same fate met the majority of the delegates to the 17th Party of Congress. Of 1,966 delegates, 1,108 were arrested on charges of revolutionary crimes, i.e. decidedly more than a majority. The banal truth is that today's success is tomorrow's failure. Everybody wants a winner. Nobody likes a loser. That nothing succeeds like success is true not only for bourgeois society, but for its critique, Marxism. Marxists also want to win, or at least to side with the winners. Orthodox Marxism has chased after success, and this hunt has paralyzed its critical nerve, past and present. Before World War I, the German Social Democrats exercised hegemony by virtue of their strength and electoral victories. After their moral and political collapse in World War I, the Russian Revolution and the Bolsheviks assumed this role. With the discrediting of the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution and Maoism stepped in. Because each worked, each promised to deliver the magic formula for success. The final argument flung by the Leninists at the non-Leninists was that Lenin succeeded. The non-Leninists were not only wrong, they failed. The lure of success and the sweet smell of victory fuel orthodox Marxism. Marxism-Leninism Marxism excludes the no-nonsense of how to succeed. This is the source of its perpetual attraction as a doctrine. Unlike anarchism, syndicalism, or council communism, it has proved itself, offering victorious revolutions for emulation. Everything pales before the fact of victory. The adherents of orthodox Marxism extol and promote the victorious revolutions and parties as the route to success, until their shortcomings or failures become too blatant, then another is adopted. The ex post facto element damns this Marxism to apologetics. Marxism degenerates into public relations for revolutionary movements. It turns critical only at last resort. It may suffice for philosophy to attain wisdom at dusk, but Marxism must commence its flight earlier. To condemn the failures after the verdict is too late. The issues are complex. Future events are beyond grasp. History provides no refunds, guarantees, or insurance policies. The misappraisal of the successful revolution or the revolution in the making, the premature celebration, the mistake, or the retraction forms the marrow of the human experience in history. 
Therefore, the charge that a mistake has been made or has been belatedly corrected is itself compromised. It assumes a position outside of history where there are no choices, failures, mistakes, or successes. The charge implies that it is better not to choose and retreats to the tired wisdom that history is bunk and vanity, or it hides behind academic knowledge too cautious to think and judge. If this is true, it is also insufficient. This rejoinder slips into the Sena V attitude, which excuses inter indifferently all theories and commitments. It is no sin to be wrong, but it is no virtue to be wrong consistently. This is the question that Orthodox Marxism provokes. History is assembled from a series of discrete mechanisms. If one breaks down, another is always available. This approach is immunized against criticism by a continual shifting of its object. Last year, Maoism, this year, the prison movement, next year, the working class. A minor example is Charles Bettelheim, a respected French Marxist who resigned from the Franco-China Friendship Association, May 1977, marking his break with post-Maoist China. For many years, he enthusiastically praised the Cultural Revolution and Maoism. Now he believes that the campaign against the Gang of Four commenced a great leap backward. The ease with which the advances of Mao's cultural revolution are being undone suggests to Bettelheim that the seeds for the re reversal were planted earlier. Something must have been amiss with the cultural revolution itself that allowed it to be set aside so rapidly. Indeed, Bettelheim tells us, when we look back and analyze what has happened since 1965 to 66, we can say that this change in the relation of forces was already apparent in the first months of 1967. He goes on to identify some features of this change. Introduction of coercion, displacement of mass participation, rise of sectarianism, and so on. This may be fine and good, but why do we learn this only now? The answer is obvious. Although Bettelheim says that the changes were already apparent in 1967, they were not apparent to him and many others for another 10 years. The reasons that he now adduces for the great leap backward were presented as successfully overcome in his cultural revolution and industrial organization in China, 1973. He wrote then that through discussions and struggles involving millions of workers and vast sections of the population, a new road was opened up in the struggle for socialism. It constitutes a decisive and permanent achievement, as decisive and permanent as any scientific or social experience which discovers new processes or new objective laws. Nor was this the first time that Bettelheim identified permanent scientific achievements that did not turn out to be permanent, scientific, or achievements. He analyzed imperfectly the Russian Revolution and the transition from capitalism to socialism. In the mid-1960s, Bettelheim defended Stalin's ideas on the law of value and a socialist society against Che Guevara. The rejoinder by Che decreed Bettelheim's mechanical and undialectical approach. Several years later, 1969, Bettelheim debated the same issue with Paul Sweezy. In 1974, Bettelheim admitted that his writings in the period 1962 to 67 on the transition from capitalism to socialism were not satisfactory. The problem was that until 1956, he had taken the Soviet Union as a model for revolution. The problem persisted for another 10 years, however. Only the lessons of the Chinese Cultural Revolution induced him to modify very seriously the terms of my analysis. Hence, Bettelheim began a major reevaluation of the Russian Revolution in class struggles in the USSR, 1974. Two additional problems emerge here. His serious modification of the evaluation of Russia is not very serious. Bettelheim repeats the past quasi-official Chinese position on the Russian Revolution, and now that the Cultural Revolution has proved deficient, he may have to reevaluate it. Consequently, his reevaluation of the Russian Revolution may have to be reevaluated, and so on. Is this gloating? To stand utterly outside the fray is hardly virtuous. It purchases purity by cashing in critical intelligence and commitment. 
To enter into the fray inevitably yields mistakes, including major ones. There are no innocents in politics, yet neither is everyone equally guilty. Distinctions can and must be made. Political intellectuals who are perpetually on the hunt for successful revolutions betray their ethos, success. The issue is not the failings of an individual, but a style and procedure that eviscerates Marxism. Success is peddled until it fails, and then it is peddled again in a new form. At any single instant, the success appears more than convincing. The facts are on its side, whereas the critics command only theories and harping objections. The Russian, Chinese, and Cuban revolutions silence critics by their existence and success. Debray's 1967 revolution in the revolution enthusiastically prescribed the Cuban model of revolution for all of South America. Ten years later, the situation was sobering, the success non-existent. Gerard Cheon titles his recent analysis of Debray's theory, Guerrilla Inflation, the Foucault theory as a theory for failure. Debray himself hardly disagrees with its judgment. He now calls his pamphlet a book of the moment. Some of this can and has been characterized as third worldism, the pursuit and promotion of third world revolutions by North American and Western European intellectuals. Yet the style has worked as effectively and perniciously within the industrial nations. The black movement, urban guerrillas, the prison movement, women, youth, national minorities, and the working class itself have all been objects of instant mytho mytholog mythologizing hate that word. Not the least of the ills of orthodox Marxism is the wake it leaves of demoralization and cynicism. Hopes perpetually raised and dashed take their toll. Of its more public figures can switch objects without losing a beat. Others have graver difficulties. Who can transfer their loyalties without doubt from the Soviet Union to China to North Korea to Albania? or from the working class to the student movement, to the black movement, to the third world, back to the working class. The committed are leached out. The old anti-communist God that failed becomes the weary gods that failed. For many Marxists, an old routine has been refurbished to account for perpetual mistakes, self-criticism. Louis Althusser developed this into a fine art and an effective marketing strategy. As an art, it neatly absolves past mistakes, makes way for new ones, and implies that the critics are spiteful and malicious for harping on the past. Who wants to criticize those who criticize themselves? As a commercial strategy, it is marketed by the engineers of the planned obsolescence of thought. Each theoretical innovation is fabricated from defective parts, designed for breakdown and replacement. The intellectual turns into a perpetual book buyer, compelled to buy the latest work to replace the preceding one. Althusser not only invented theoretical practice, but pioneered in its malpractice. First, he argued that Marx definitely broke with Hegel. Several years later, he confessed, I must admit that I have given a much too abrupt idea of this thesis. Then he admitted that in his notion of Marx's epistemological break, I made two mistakes. It was neither epistemological nor a break. He also erred in reading Capital, calling philosophy a theory of theoretical practice. This mistake was not simply terminological ambiguity, but one of an error in the conception itself. He also mistakenly concluded that philo philosophy is a science and has an object in history. Later, he discovered that philosophy is not a science and has no object and no history. He also remembered in passing that he forgot about class struggle in For Marx and Reading Capital. This is certainly the biggest mistake I made. The list, if honest, is hardly enviable, nor is it exhaustive. Moreover, what Reich said of Freud, even where he was wrong, he was right, can be said in the inverse of Althusser. Even where he is right, he is wrong. Althusser represents a Marxism that is forever wrong or right too late. To explain his multiple mis miscalculations, he reaches for an alibi beyond reproach, history. 
The irony is missed. Althusser and his followers have dedicated themselves to slaying the dangerous dragon of a historicism. Historicism threatens the autonomy, rigor, objectivity, and finally, the success of Marxism. For Althusser, historicism corrupts with Hegelian effluence the science of Marxism. Yet Althusser justifies all his mistakes by claiming that they were committed at a particular time and place, as if there could be some doubt about this. In Althusser's jargon, the conjuncture, the exact balance of forces at any given moment, is the universal excuse for errors. The fetish of indi indicating the exact time when they wrote, rewrote, and corrected their manuscripts characterizes all the Althus Althusserians. This furnishes the gloss of precision while anticipating a revision of the theory when the conjuncture changes. Nikos Polansis closes his fascism and dictatorship melodramatically. Given the aim of this book, I prefer to give this conclusion a date, Paris, July, 1970. To understand these essays, Althusser tells us in the introduction to For Marx, and to pass judgment on them, it is essential to realize that they were conceived, written, and published in a particular ideological and theoretical conjuncture. Or he suggests that the exceptional situation in which his essay on Lacan was written explains why it is why it has to either be corrected or expanded. The evil is not in the appeal to history. Rather, history becomes the insurance policy for the perpetual theoretical malpractice suits. The theory or theorist is never wrong and never reconceived. The guilt resides in the historical process, the conjuncture. In this way, orthodox Marxism immunizes itself. It is always wrong or too late. The fault lies elsewhere. Althusser's response to one of his critics, John Lewis, indicates his achievement. He chastises Lewis for ignoring the historical situation in which For Marx was written, and then awards himself a badge for courage and pers perspicuity. Mr. Lewis never talks about this political history. In For Marx, that is, in 1965, I was already writing about Stalin. Some 30 years after the Moscow trials, or 10 short years after Khrushchev denounced Stalin, Althusser was already criticizing Stalin. Althusser dreams he heads the theoretical parade while tidying up years after the procession has passed him by. If success needs re-scrutiny, so does failure. Neither success nor failure can be accepted as a blank fact. Success or its absence is only one factor in the evaluation of a politics. We do not condemn the collaborators with Nazism because they picked the losing side, nor do we condemn the Spanish loyalists and Republicans because they lost. The history of the opposition to Orthodox Marxism, Council Communism, Left Communism, Dissidents, Currents, and so on, is without doubt a history of failure yet it is nonetheless valuable. Failure proves nothing except who lost. This is often forgotten. No one likes losers. The history of revolution is usually presented as a string of victories, blemished by some setbacks and defeats. Rarely does one find honesty com comparable to that of Marx. After the revolutions of 1848, he wrote, with the exception of a few short chapters, every important part of the annals of the revolution from 1848 to 1849 carries the heading, Defeat of the Revolution. Summarizing the intervening period, some 15 years later, he wrote, If then there had been no solidarity of action between the British and the continental working classes, there was, at all events, a solidarity of defeat. Outside Marxism, the same issue, issues of success and failure have surfaced, although not in the same form. In historical and sociological studies, controversy has flourished for years about the autonomy and resistance of various social formations, American Blacks, working class, Jews, women, and so on. 
Evaluations differ on their degree of independence and resistance within the oppressive environments of slavery, concentration camps, and bourgeois society. Interpretations tend to fall into two types. One stresses autonomy and relative success at resistance. The other stresses the converse, the power and ability of the estab establishment to repress or incorporate an opposition. The issues are emotionally and finally politically charged. This is the point. A politics governs and fuels this debate. A left tends to elevate the advances and autonomy of the underlying class or group, and the right extols the power or genius of the establishment. To be sure, the politics is often implicit, but for this reason, it is so much the more potent. It is never questioned and thus congeals into a dogma. The left always and everywhere finds advances of the subaltern groups. As a dogma, it might be better than most, and it does seem to rest on a self-evident proposition. Victims in history resist. They are also subjects of history. Yet it also draws upon the myth of success, an upbeat vision of past and future conflicts. An examination of the strength of the establishment is dismissed as reactionary. Analysis of social relations that include or induced identification and not independence and resistance is precluded. Is it the task of a left to always find victories and successes of the suppressed? This degrades the critique of capitalism to cheering the home team, and it ill serves its subject by minimizing the density and complexity of the oppressive social relations. That the oppressed were terrorized by terror conveys no insult. That they sold out to eat and live suggests no dishonor. The urge to people the desert of history is public relations for the moguls who have wasted it. The configuration of these debates testifies to the same pressures at work inside Marxism, the inclination to present the struggle as upward and successful. Certainly in the recent historical and sociological studies, the provocations have never been lacking. To argue that there was little resistance to slavery as Stanley Elkins did, or to Nazi extermination as Bruno, Bruno Bettelheim and Hannah Arendt did, or to bourgeois power as working class studies did, was to insult, and the insult was compounded when it was further argued there was not only little resistance, but complicity and cooperation. These works of Elkins, Bettelheim, and Arendt marked one swing of the pendulum. In more recent years, historical studies have moved in the opposite direction and have stressed the forms of resistance by slaves, Jews, the working classes, and women. If more just, this perspective begins to shade into a mythic vision of resistance and progress. At this point, it raises more questions than it answers. The image of success and victories vies with the actual defeats and setbacks. If, for instance, the working classes were progressing in their culture, struggles, and class consciousness, their defeat or relative passivity would become not more but less understandable. If the structure and toll of domination are omitted, history is treated for cosmetics. A history from above of the intricate machinery of class domination is thus no less essential than a history from below. Indeed, without it, the latter in the end becomes one-sided, if the better side. For those who imagine that dialectics consists of matching mathematical opposites, no problem exists. On one hand, there is domination, on the other, resistance. Marcuse's one-dimensional man was regularly derided as undialectical. Marcuse forgot that society was two-dimensional. Domination always incites resistance. This is the official Marxist interpretation of everything, or the power of positive thinking for Marxists. Any suggestion of the victory of the state or bourgeois culture is countered by stressing the victory of the working classes and their culture. Each negative statement is answered by a positive. The total is zero. This mathematical interpretation of history issues into a picture of forces of liberation battling the forces of domination. 
If this is adequate for actual warfare, it fails as a model for the existence and persistence of capitalism. Capitalism does not simply rely on perpetual military subjugation. For this reason, any blank juxtaposition of history from above and history from below threatens to conclude in two volume works with few transitions. The crucial question is the relationship between these two histories. The official proletarian culture of the Third International and most recently China portrayed only smiling, working and powerfully powerful peasants. Frowns, sickness, betrayals and defeats were eschewed. Andre Zdanov, uh, proponent of socialist realism, explained why optimism and heroism were the guiding slogans. Our Soviet literature is impregnated with enthusiasm and the spirit of heroic deeds. It is optimistic in essence because it is the literature of the rising class of the proletariat. This is the open and hidden logic of orthodox Marxism and recent historical studies. The need to stress the victories of the oppressed is deep-seated and humanistic, but it maltreats its subject when the objective defeats and surrenders, political and psychological, are whitewashed and remain unrecognized and uncomprehended. Let there be no misunderstanding. The vision of unresisting victims by the social worker or the philanthropist is no better. This is a static view of history or the administrative dream of the world. The application of the dialectical scheme that decays into a behavioral psychology must also be avoided. Stimulus provokes a response or repression yields rebellion. Both visions corrode into myths. Distancing oneself from the political plane reveals the theoretical outline of orthodox Marxism, which is marked by a commitment to science. An esteem for science is hardly unique to Marxism. It infuses modern society. Science guarantees success. Marxism inherited this proposition from bourgeois society and hammered it into a deadly weapon. For Marxists, it became the revolver for shooting dissidents and opponents. The primal and final charge that orthodox Marxism invokes is that its opponents have violated the canons of science. They are pre-scientific, non-scientific, literary, romantic, utopian, historicist, humanist, aesthetic. Marx labeled his own work scientific, contrasting it to utopian and other brands of socialism. There is no royal road to science, he cautioned his French readers of Capital. Yet Marx employed the term science sparingly, wary of excess usage. More important for Marx, science meant Wissenschaft, a term that resounds with Hegelian tones. That the English and French science is more limited than the German Wissenschaft is a point regularly made in cultural and intellectual studies. Because it involves the entire question of Hegel's impacts on Marxism, however, it merits more attention than a footnote. If Marx deemed his own work scientific, he distrusted a religion of science. <clears throat> on more than one occasion, he dissociated himself from the term scientific socialism. Marx, Marx charged Proudhon with fetishizing science. No school of thought has thrown around the word science more haphazardly than that of Proudhon. For Proudhon, science reduces itself to a slender proportion of a scientific formula. He is the man in search of, of formulas. Years later, responding to Bakunin's accusation that scientific socialism was elitist, Marx clarified, Scientific socialism was only used in opposition to utopian socialism, which wants to attach the people to new delusions instead of, instead of limiting its science to the knowledge of the social movement made by the people itself. That science here meant knowledge of the social movement made by the people itself suggests the divergence between the Hegelian Wissenschaft and the French and English science. This can be overstated, but the terms illuminate and ultimately sustain two conflicting Marxist approaches to history and society. The distinction between Wissenschaft and science gains currency only outside of the natural and exact sciences. 
This already structures the problem. The issue was how to transfer the methods of the natural sciences to the social, political, and philosophical terrain. The palpable advances of the natural sciences rendered this a compelling project. In duplicating the methods of the natural sciences, the hope was to duplicate its achievements. This project inspired myriad thinkers from Auguste Comte to Emil Durkheim, Karl Popper, and contemporary social scientists, and it forms the nub and hub of positivist non-Hegelian science. The history of these efforts is neither simple nor monotonous, and it is cluttered with reservations and qualifications. Each thinker selected and prized only some of the features of the natural sciences, quantification, natural laws, objectivity, clarity, and so on. Comte is illustrative. He originally considered sociology a special kind of physics. By name and substance, Comte patterned social physics on the natural sciences. He regarded all phenomena as subjected to invariable natural laws. Our business is to pursue an accurate discovery of these laws with a view to reducing them to the smallest possible number. The best illustration of this is in the case of the doctrine of gravitation. <clears throat> in one fashion or another, positivist science imitated and adopted the procedures of the natural sciences. For example, the program of the Vienna Circle sought to replicate the progress of the natural sciences. The scientific world conception, the program explained, was empiricist and positivist and applied logical analysis. These features called forth others. A scientific world conception necessitated the search for a neutral system of formulae, for a symbolism freed from the slag of historical languages. Neatness and clarity are striven for, the dark distances and unfathomable depths rejected. The slag of historical languages is the heap that separates the positivist science from the Hegelian Wissenschaft. In the Hegelian tradition, the slag of history is as valuable as the nuggets. History is not footnoted or discarded, rather it infuses the theory. This is where Hegelian and positivist science separate. The natural world and its sciences knows history only externally. History does not determine structure or method. The difference between the study of the moon and the French Revolution is history. Inquiries of human behavior inspired by the study of the moon or the atom suppress or belittle the historical dimension. History does not mean here a chronicle of events, but the story of humanity as actor and victim. As Hegel's greatest student wrote, men make their own history, adding the crucial qualification, but they do not make it just as they please. Positivist science tends to eliminate history as so much slag or intellectual baggage. To be sure, the natural wor world and the natural sciences are hardly impervious to history. The problems and approaches are themselves a product of history, but finally the structure of the moon or the atom is not historical. Human history, wrote Marx citing v Vico, differs from natural history in that we have made the former but not the latter. The Hegelian Wissenschaft is not wider or larger than the positivist science, rather it is impregnated with history. The natural reality and natural sciences do not know the fundamental historical categories. Conscious and self-consciousness, subjectivity and objectivity, appearance and essence. In direct opposition to Hegelian logic, Otto Neurath, with Hans Hahn and Rudolf Carnap, wrote for the Vienna Circle, In science there are no depths, there is surface everywhere. Or, a scientific description can contain only the structure of objects, not their essence. Subjectively experienced qualities, redness, pleasure, are as such only experiences, not knowledge. Yet Hegelian thought must not be confused with mysticism or irrationality. It does not promote the cult of depths and essence, essences. Positive and empirical sciences are not false, but limited. To such questions as when Caesar was born, or how many feet there were in a stadium, etc., 
a neat answer should be given, just as it is surely true that the square of the hypotenuse equals the squares of the other two sides of a right-angled triangle. But the nature of such so-called truths is different from the nature of philosophical truths. The logic of empirical science and common sense is not so much true or untrue as correct or incorrect. It does not attain truth. The judgment, the rose is red or is not red, can only be correct within the limited circle of perception. To Hegel, the ideal of the positive sciences, mathematics, is vulnerable to the same criticism. As a single mode of cognition, it is external and indifferent, as well as limited. Our knowledge would be in a very awkward predicament if such objects as freedom, law, morality, or even God himself, because they cannot be measured and calculated or expressed in a mathematical formula, were to be reckoned beyond the reach of exact knowledge. As object and method, Hegel's Wissenschaft is saturated with history. This finally constitutes Hegel's protest against the positive and empirical sciences. They are historically blind and treat truths as formal and static. Truth is not a minted coin which can be given and pocketed ready-made. History is a means and an end. The harmoniousness of childhood is a gift from the hand of nature. The second harmony must spring from the labor and culture of the spirit, from the historical process. These teachings of Hegel were neither well received nor well preserved. The story of the impact of Hegelian thought takes volumes. It is germane here in regard to a single issue. The critique of positivist science that does not collapse into irrationality or existentialism is unthinkable without Hegelian thought. This is why the reception of Hegel by Marxists is fundamental. As the following chapter seeks to demonstrate, this reception preceded and defined the texture of Marxism. Hegel remains an outsider to the major philosophical traditions. For instance, Anglo-American courses in the history of philosophy typically end with Kant and recommence in the 20th century with Ludwig Wittgenstein, Bertrand Russell, and the Vienna Circle. The 19th century, with the troubling Hegel, as well as Marx, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Schopenhauer, is regularly omitted or palmed off to the literature department, or to teachers not yet hired or about to be fired. Karl Popper's valuation, if not representative, at least suggests the deep and general mistrust. In the open society, a book that he tells us is grounded in a rational attitude of openness of criticism, Popper introduces an excellent, or introduces as excellent, the following judgment of Hegel. Hegel was a flat-headed, insipid, nauseating, illiterate charlatan who reached the pinnacle of audacity in scribbling together and dishing up the crassest, mystifying no nonsense. This nonsense has been noisily proclaimed as immortal wisdom by mercenary followers and readily accepted as such by all fools. Harsh. If Hegel fared better in the Marxist traditions, it was perhaps because he attracted little interest. He was easily situated, interpreted, and forgotten with the aid of some phrases by Marx or especially some texts by he Engels. Hegel was honored as the originator of idealistic dialectics, which with juggling could be rendered materialistic and scientific. They were ultimately codified by Stalin into a set of laws. What Lenin scribbled down during the enforced leisure of World War I when he began to study Hegel remained an isolated statement. It is impossible completely to understand capital without having thoroughly studied and understood the whole of Hegel's logic. Consequently, none of the Mar Marxists have understood Marx. Yet Hegel's role, or lack of a role, should not be exaggerated. Neither the presence or absence, nor the accurate or inaccurate interpretation of a single thinker can be held accountable for the vagaries of political and social movements. In this sense, the relation of Hegel to Marxism, or Darwin to social Darwin Darwinism, is not cause and effect. The founders succumb to the imperatives of their followers. That Hegel has been consistently misread or unread 
suggests something important about the fabric of orthodox Marxism. Hegel proved a threat to the dominant idea of science. Consequently, orthodox Marxism has sought either to reduce Hegel to a positivist notion of science or to purge him from Marxism. This has remained a current project of orthodox Marxism. In recent years, Althusser assumed this task. He is a short course on what is orthodox Marxism. His work has been marked by two closely related elements, a phobia of Hegel and a passion for science. We have the right and the duty politically to use and defend by fighting for the word, the philosophical category of science. To use and defend the word science is a, necess a necessity in order to resist the bourgeois subjective idealists and the petty bourgeois Marxists. The main weapon of the petty bourgeois hordes is history, or historicism in Althusser's lexicon. History and historicism compri co compromise the rigor of science. Marxism is no more historical than language, which as Stalin showed escapes its, hist its history. Next to history, the main danger to science is Hegel. Althusser has met this danger through exorcism. He argued that the young Marx was never strictly speaking a Hegelian, except in 1844 when he broke with Hegel. Althusser learned that this was never strictly speaking true, except when he said it in 1965. Later, he discovered Hegel everywhere and recast his thesis to save it. Marx was engaged in a lifelong flight from Hegel and he attained safety only in death. With Althusser, anything short of rigor mortis lacks rigor. The living Marx was tainted with Hegel. The famous preface of 1859 is still profoundly Hegelian evolutionist. Althusser's Geiger counter picks up Hegelian radi radiation even in capital. Its 1% of Hegelian radioactivity is flagrant and extremely harmful. Only Marx's notes on Wagner, written the year before his death, are totally and de definitely exempt from any trace of Hegelian influence. That generation's of Marxists have been seduced by a popular idea of science cannot simply be traced to intellectual confusion. It is rooted rather in the ambivalent relationship between Marxism and bourgeois society. If Marx was capitalism's greatest critic, he was also its greatest admirer. Marx's own position can be presented theoretically with some precision, but more or less theoretically, it has presented individual Marxists of specific societies with endless difficulties. Capitalism was denounced for its exploitation, its brutality, pollution, hypocrisy, the list goes on. Yet it was welcomed, even celebrated, because it represented a giant step out of a pre-bourgeois order. Socialism could only be established on the foundation and wealth that capitalism produced. Capitaliz capitalism was not only indispensable, it was desirable. The message for individual Marxists was more complex, especially for those located in societies where the work of capitalism was incomplete. This included all Marxists, with the possible exception of the English. In all other countries, capitalism remained a progressive force, and the working class was to abet capitalism until the material foundations for socialism had been created. The lesson was difficult and unpalatable. In January 1849, Marx advised the German Democrats and workers, we are certainly the last people to desire the rule of the bourgeoisie. Yet it is better to suffer in modern bourgeois society, which by its industry creates the material means for the foundation of a new society that will liberate you all, than to revert to a bygone form of society which thrusts the entire nation back into medieval barbarism. This says it exactly, perhaps too exactly, for this provoked responses from an ultra-left impatient with its evolutionary logic. Although these objections are generally ignored or slighted in the official histories, they touch a raw nerve of Marxism. In the aftermath of 1848, when these objections were raised, Marx advocated incremental social transformation. Protests emerged from various quarters and finally split the Communist League, to which Marx and Engels belonged. Andreas Gottschalk, 
asked Marx sarcastically. Why should we make a revolution? Why should we, men of the proletariat, spill our blood? Should we really escape the hell of the Middle Ages by precipitating ourselves into the purgatory of decrepit capitalist rule? You are not serious about the liberation of the oppressed. The charge was not fair, yet it located a tension in Marxism that regularly de degenerated into a simple af affirmation. Where capitalism was incomplete, Marxists were required to finish its work. The evil of retrograde social development was met by blessing capitalist development, which would finally issue into a new social order. This evolutionary logic was more than logic. It brought in its train attitudes and beliefs that corroded the theoretical and psychological impulse to subvert capitalism. The evaluation of colonialism by Marx displayed these same features. Brutal robbery and exploitation marked colonialism. Insofar as the material foundations of capitalism were established, however, colonialism progressed willy-nilly toward socialism. This, in brief, constituted Marx's appraisal of the English colonization of India. The devastating effects of English industry when contemplated with, reg with regard to India are palpable and confounding. But England has a double mission in India, destroying the old society and the laying of the material foundations of Western society in Asia. Modern industry will dissolve the hereditary divisions of labor upon which rest the Indian castes, those decisive impediments to Indian progress and Indian power. From the Communist Manifesto to Capital, the same dialectical vision informed Marx's analysis of modern industry. Marx never doubted that the drive for profits constantly impelled the bourgeoisie to revolutionize the instruments of production. Modern industry never views or treats the existing form of production process as the definitive one. It techni its technical basis is therefore revolutionary, whereas all earlier modes of production were essentially conservative. Yet the social relations in which the technical basis of production was enmeshed constituted the devastating negative side. If the terms are clear enough, the substance is not. That it has taken countless scholars to determine exactly what Marx was saying only suggests the difficulty of Marxists faced uh, with political options and choices. The history of Marxism is the history of the loss of the dialectical critique of bourgeois society. The irresistible temptation was to cast the dialectical movements of society into a one-way and upward path. Progress in capitalism was read as progress toward socialism. The texts of Marx could always be interpreted in this light. Marxists were confident that their science was grounded in the actual movements of society. This distinguished Marxism from other and utopian socialisms, which fled into the past or into rural enclaves. For the Marxists, however, the critique of capitalism was corroded by the endorsement of its achievements. Every chapter in the history of Marxism has been rent by this dialectic or inconsistency. The, de the denunciation of capitalism vied with its affirmation. The beginnings of Russian Marxism conformed to this pattern. Appealing to economic or cultural realities, the populists argued that Russia would or should escape the disaster and evil of capitalist development. The Marxists retorted that capitalism was and should be developing in Russia. This laid the foundation for a proletariat and finally a socialist revolution. For these reasons, capitalism could be evaluated as progressive. Lenin's development of capitalism in Russia in 1900 pursued this in detail. Inasmuch as the Russian Marxists strained to demonstrate the factual and positive impact of capitalism, they were tempted to minimize its destructiveness. If more capitalism was preferable to less, was the critique of capitalism itself vitiated? Lenin directly addressed this question. Recognition of the progressiveness of this role of capitalism is quite compatible with the full recognition of the, ne of the negative and dark sides of capitalism. 
Yet for many Russian Marxists, this recognition proved difficult to maintain in practice. They extolled capitalism so enthusiastically that they forgot about socialism or tired of it. They no longer grasped how or where socialism differed from capitalism. This set the stage for a return to religion. The legal Marxists were especially prey to these options. Serge Bulgakov exulted as a Marxist that every new factory, every new industrial enterprise carries us forward. And he ended as a priest decreeing the mechanical necessity of Marxism. Struve, a legal Marxist, closed his major study with the words, let us confess our cultural backwardness and let us go and learn from the capitalism and ended as a liberal. The same ambiguity corroded the Marxist opposition to colonialism. The Second International condemned colonialism as a violent appendage of capitalism. To some Marxists, however, it served a necessary and positive function in propelling the colonized along the path of indu industrialization. As one exponent of a positive colonial policy phrased it, the primitive peoples will reach civilization only by bearing this cross of capitalism. It is therefore our duty not to hinder the development of capitalism, an indispensable chain in the history of humanity. We can even favor its appearance. The evaluation of technology by Marxists succumbed to the same pressures. A dialectical critique was sloughed off. Marxists did not doubt that technology constituted the greatest achievement of capitalism, distinguishing it from all previous societies. The suffering or misfortune resulting from, te from technology was caused by the social context, not the apparatus itself. Such logic stuffed technology into familiar categories of means and ends. Technology was at best and worst a neutral endeavor. The evil resided only in the ends to which it was used. This approach infused orthodox Marxism. It cannot be accused of distorting Marx. Marx had always been a sharp critic of utopian, feudal, and romantic socialism. Each was oblivious or antagonistic toward the technological advances of capitalist industrialization. Little seemed more certain than that Marxists accepted and even accelerated these advances. Nevertheless, a yawning gap between the general principles and the particulars vitiated a critical appropriation of a technological world. Technology everywhere was welcomed as facilitating socialism and for that reason was exempted from critical inspection. Marx was, of course, completely cognizant of the destructiveness of the labor process. On occasion, however, he had suggested that the divisions of labor within the factory were planned and regulated, whereas those in the larger society were unregulated and anarchistic. The notion was attractive and popular because it inferred that the factory and technology were the progressive elements of capitalism. Irrationality was confined to the marketplace and found its boundary at the factory gate. Furthermore, the notion accorded with common sense, which could confirm the confusion and lawlessness of the market, but was mute before the apparent rationality and efficiency of production itself. Yet such a perspective capitulated to the mystique of technology. It reduced revolution to sacking the bosses while protecting as sac sac sacrosanct the technological base. Lenin's evaluation of technology and of Taylorism in particular participated in this logic. The weakness of capitalist technology and Taylorism lay in their confinement to the factory. He said, capital organizes and rationalizes labor within the factory. In social production as a whole, however, chaos continues to reign and grow. Lenin recognized that the Taylor system, like all capitalist progress, is a combination of the refined brutality of bourgeois exploitation and a number of the greatest scientific achievements. The lesson was clear. The Soviet Republic must, at all costs, adopt all that is valuable in the achievements of science and technology in this field. The possibility of building socialism depends exactly upon our success in combining the Soviet power and the Soviet organization of administration with the up-to-date achievements of capitalism. 
we must organize in Russia the study and teaching of the Taylor system and systematically try it out and adapt it to our own ends. Stalin later defined Leninism as a combination of Russian revolutionary sweep with American efficiency. The uncritical enthusiasm for technology was not grounded simply in the textual complexities of Marx, nor was the plan to adopt and accelerate capitalist industrialization based simply on a misreading of Marx. Such an argument ascribes too much importance to the texts. Rather, the social economic imperatives of backwardness suppressed the dialectical technique or critique of technology. This resounds throughout Lenin's writings. The work of capitalism was palpably incomplete, and if this was obvious to the Russians, then Marxists in Italy, France, and Germany were just as convinced. If today large regions within the industrially advanced countries are underdeveloped, this was evidently more striking a century ago. Of course, what constituted underdevelopment or overdeveloped is the essence of the matter. Marx studied England because he was convinced that other West European countries would replicate its history. The country that is more developed industrially only shows the less developed, the image of its own future. Germany, in comparison, suffered not only from the development of capitalist production, but also from the incompleteness of, the, of that development. The incompleteness of economic development as fact or conviction encouraged the acceptance of evolutionary theories. For the first generation of Marxists after Marx, capitalism proved its ability to not only limp along, but to develop and expand. The last part of the century witnessed both the perfecting of new industrial technology, cheap steel electric power, and the transformation of consumption, sewing machines, cheap clocks, bicycles, electric lighting. That these were not equally distributed is not to the point. They never had been. They suggested, however, that capitalism had hardly ceased to progress. The evolutionary progress of capitalism called forth and ratified the evolutionary and scientific doctrines of Marxists. The critique of bourgeois society, Marxism, progressively lost its bite. The distance between Marxism and bourgeois society narrowed. Marxists and their opponents shared the belief in science, progress, and success. Revolution was not simply adjourned, rather the Marxists embraced the scientific and industrial rationality as their own. They saw themselves accelerating the advances of capitalism. The phenomenon of Marxist, Marxists extolling and finally succumbing to capitalism did not go completely unnoticed. If the participants were blind, those on the outside or margins of Marxism were not. It is hardly fortuitous that the historian and sociologist of capitalist rationality, Max Weber, recognized the spirit of capitalism in the lair of the Marxists. He visited a party congress of the German Social Democrats in 1906 and concluded, these gentlemen no longer frighten anyone. The following year, he debated conservative sociologists on the threat of SPD electoral victory in several German cities. I see no danger for bourgeois society in surrendering, surrendering our cities to the SPD, said Weber. He noted that no revolutionary enthusiasm was expressed at the recent SPD Congress, and he anticipated that a victorious SPD would follow a mercantile policy, encouraging the growth of capital. The profound complicity of orthodox Marxism in bourgeois industrialization is exposed by an absence. In the Marxist tradition, a searching critique of the secondary characteristics of capitalism is lacking. Secondary refers to those features that stand once removed from the primary economic organization of wages, working conditions, imperialism, and the market. <coughs> It refers to a series of relations, such as urbanism, mass media, psychological life, and leisure. These are not necessarily second in importance, but are second in that they cannot exist apart from the basic political economic organization of society. In recent decades, 
These areas have increasingly drawn the attention of Marxists, but earlier Marxists ignored them. The few analyses offered have been pedestrian and predictable. The secondary features have been disposed of by concepts taken from the basic dictionary of Marxism. Superstructure, relations of production, accumulation, and so on. If none of these concepts have been wrong, none have grasped the specificity of the phenomenon. The usual explanation for the banality of Marxism refers to the ills of vulgar Marxism. Vulgar Marxism is vulgar in its economic reductionism. Everything lacks substance and reality beyond an economic base. This does not suffice as an explanation for the lameness of Marxism. Not only vulgar Marxism, but its vulgar critique needs to be surmounted. The vulgar critique of vulgar Marxism glosses over the complicity between the Marxists and the secondary features of capitalism. This was the reason for blindness. They did not perceive these features as fundamentally changing, hence there was no reason for scrutiny. The Marxists would inherit, inherit the cities and the mass newspapers. Only the signs and headlines would be changed. Rockefeller Plaza would become Leninplatz. The basic rapport with industrial life paralyzed the critique. This can be stated in, in the obverse more emphatically. The most compelling and illuminating an analyses of the secondary processes derive from a conservative, sometimes reactionary tradition. This runs from Nietzsche and Spengler to contemporary and surely lesser critics such as Jacques Ellul and Ivan Illich. This is hardly a coherent tradition and it is radically flawed in more than one respect, yet the analyses that are preferred are unmatched and unassimilated by Marxists. <coughs> For example, Spengler's analysis of the Daily Press from 1919 found no counterpart in the literature of the Marxists. English-American politics have created through the press a force field of worldwide intellectual and financial tensions in which every individual unconsciously takes up the place allotted to him so that he must think, will, and act as a ruling personality somewhere or other in the distance thinks fit. Man does not speak to man. The press and its associate, the electrical news service, keep the waking consciousness of whole peoples and continents under a deafening drumfire of theses, catchwords, standpoints, scenes, feelings, day by day and year by year. The scattered sheets of the Age of Enlightenment transform themselves into the press, a term of most significant anonymity. Today we live so cowed under the bombardment of this intellectual artillery that hardly anyone can attain to the inward detachment that is required for a clear view of the monstrous drama. The liberal bourgeois mind is proud of the abolition of censorship, the last restraint, while the dictator of the press, Northcliffe keeps the slave gang of his readers under the whip of his leading articles, telegrams, and pictures. Democracy has, by its newspapers, completely expelled the book from the mental life of the people. The people read then one paper, its paper, which forces itself through the front doors by millions daily, spellbinds the intellect from morning to night, drives the book into oblivion by its more engaging layout, and if one or another specimen of a book does emerge into visibility, forestalls and eliminates its possible effects by reviewing it. What the press wills is true. Its commanders evoke, transform, interchange truths. Three weeks of press work and the truth is acknowledged by everybody. The reader neither knows nor is allowed to know the purpose for which he is used. A more appalling character of freedom of thought cannot be imagined. Formerly, a man did not dare to think freely. Now he dares, but cannot. This assault on capitalism can also be found in Nietzsche's analysis of morality and bad conscience, or more recently in Illich's discussion of the med medicalization of society. These conservative critics penetrate and grasp phenomena that the Marxists revere and pass over. The sources of their insight are at hand. Unlike the Marxists, they find capitalists rationality and progress grating. 
This allows and encourages insights barred to the Marxists, who are less hostile to the beat of capitalism. The Marxists hear the squeaks and groans where the mechanism needs oil and new bearings. To these critics, the hum itself is offensive. To many of the conservatives, Marxism itself appeared as simply another industrialization scheme. Conventional liberalism and wisdom feared Marxism as a threat to capitalist industrialization. These critics feared the opposite, Marxism accelerating industrialization. Spengler considered Marxism a version of the English Industrial Revolution. It concentrated on business, profits, and classes. Marx was an exclusively English thinker, adopting the terms, ethics, and categories of the Industrial Revolution. He took his principles from the very thing he was fighting. Marx intended to extend capitalism to the working class, turning each worker into a merchant who would sell his labor at the highest prices. In the light of the history of Marxism and trade unions, Spengler's judgment cannot be rejected as simply perverse. Marxism is the capitalism of the working class. It is not coincidental that the few Marxists who swam against the tide of capitalist rationality did not sever all links to conservatism, romanticism, or utopianism. They remained attached to a non-capitalist logic. They include William Morris of the 19th century and Ernst Bloch, Andre Breton, and the Frankfurt School of the 20th century. Their intellectual sources enabled them to see through the mirror of the economy. They were alerted not simply to the falling rate of profit, but to the falling rate of intelligence and beauty. These figures are linked by their resistance to socialism as a souped up version of capitalism. The unorthodox Marxists retrieved the substance of Marx. Socialism promised more than a rise in wages or an expansion of cities. A rise in wages, Marx wrote in Capital, only means in fact that the length and weight of the golden chain the wage laborer has already forged for himself allows it to be loosened somewhat. Neither the elevation nor the equalization of wages was the goal of Marxist socialism. Marx early and late denounced barracks communism. Liberation is more than electing the bosses, thereby trading subjugation for self-subjugation. Criticism has plucked the imaginary flowers on the chain not in order that man shall continue to bear that chain without fantasy or con consolation, but so that he shall throw off the chain and pluck the living flower. The idioms diverge, but the basic thinking of the unorthodox Marxists does not. Morris cautioned again and again not to confuse the machinery of socialism with socialism, to substitute a business-like administration in the interests of the public for a laissez-faire and coercive regime would be a great gain, but not the goal. Socialism is not utilitarianism, it is leisure. The leisure which socialism above all things aims at obtaining for the worker is also the very thing that breeds desire, desire for beauty, for knowledge, for more abundant life, in short. Bloch salvaged the utopian and romantic note in Marxism, the naked economic orientation paralyzed orthodox Marxism. If the economy had been analytically subverted by the Marxists, the soul and belief to replace it were lacking. For Bloch, the path for utopia to science, the title of Engels' Engels's popular pamphlet skipped too much. It eliminated the driving force of the utopian vision. What Bloch called the warm current of Marxism must be retrieved, lest it be suffocated by the cold current of technocratic Marxism. Breton, like Bloch, refused to sever links to supra-economic logic and terrains. He refused the either-or of orthodoxy, either industrialization or imagination. In the realm of facts as we see it, no ambiguity is possible. All of us seek to shift power from the hands of the bourgeoisie to those of the proletariat. Meanwhile, it is nonetheless necessary that the experiment of inner life continue. In the cant of orthodox Marxism, all of these figures are charged with the same infraction, violating the code of science. 
the code adumbrated various subsections, itemizing romantic, pessimistic, subjective, and utopian violations. For one guardian, history and class consciousness was the first major eruption of the romantic, anti-scientific tradition of bourgeois thought into Marxist theory. The charge against the Frankfurt School runs, in the place of revolutionary science, enters bourgeois cultural pessimism. T.W. Adorno and Max Horkheimer were accused of spiritualism and Marcus of petty bourgeois anarchism, a crime that is extended to all those who have taken him seriously. Wilhelm Reich and his followers did not escape the police raid. Your starting point is consumption, ours is production, therefore you are not Marxists. The Surrealists were indicted for blocking capitalist development. It is necessary to affirm plainly that the movement that one could call technological machinist is destined to develop in the world in an, in, in an irresistible fashion. Communism should be one of the principal factors of its development. Against the dirty words, romanticism, subjectivism, aestheticism, utopianism, the clean ones are invoked. Science, objectivity, rigor, structure. Here, the final, almost psychological contours of our orthodox Marxism come into view. Adorno's characterization of positivism as the puritanism of knowledge holds true for orthodox Marxism. The goal is rigorous self-control and self-discipline. The asceticism of orthodox Marxism despises unregulated insight as if it were the threat it actually is. The sexual code is internalized as conceptual commandments. Suggestions of utopia and romanticism are tabooed as too suggestive. Scientific Marxism dreams not of a life without anxiety, but of master plans and inter-office memos. Structural Marxism not only examines, but is in love with structures. It fears the unstructured. Asceticism is the conceptual center of gravity of orthodox Marxism. Concepts are multiplied to stamp out dissolute thought and thinkers. The object is to become an object, hence the hatred for the subjective. That the dissenters have been regularly derided as infantile implies the psychosexual core. Authority is threatened. One critic is offended that nowhere in history and class consciousness is Marxism recognized as a real and responsible science. The gun of science is cocked whenever thought thinks too much. Another critic growls that unless we move on from the discovery of the horrors of capitalism to an attempt to understand it scientifically, we will be plagued by another 40 years of paralyzed virtuosity of the Frankfurt School. The threat of paralyzed virtuosity is met by preventative arrests and five-year plans. The first concern, wrote Horkheimer, about orthodox Marxists, when they think about freedom is the new penal system, not its abolition. Along with Benjamin Franklin, orthodox Marxism is infused with the spirit of puritanism. The mental apparatus with permanent press concepts tames the chaos of desire. Orthodox Marxism confirms what Mary Douglas called the purity rule, an increase to, to disembody or etherealize the forms of expression corresponds to a tightening net of social domination. The dirty words of Marxism and humanism itself recall the corporal and carnal reality that gives the lie to pristine theories of metastructures. As a cohort of Althusser put it, I shall not be satisfied until I either situated the, wor the word man in the necessity of the theoretical system or eliminated it as a foreign body. The conformity of orthodox Marxism serves the cold passion for science and authority. Althusser tells us that ideology belongs to the future as well as to the past. He means keep your uniforms. The logic of so much the worse for the facts challenge the regulations that have domesticated Marxism. Nevertheless, the choices are not between facts and fantasy, conceptual rigor and free association, science and poetry, or optimism and pessimism. These are the bad choices that perpetuated Marxism as caricature. The pieces do not fit neatly together, but neither does society. This suggests at least one guide for a critical Marxism. 
Do not lose the pieces.